Hello, I'm Jeff Rubin from Duke University. It's been five months since the Fleischner Society published this statement on the role of chest imaging in patient management during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the good folks at the RSNA have asked if I would provide an update on related information that's been reported over the last five months and what we have learned as it might influence the application of these guidelines for patients with COVID-19. So as a quick review, if you haven't seen them, we published three scenarios that describe the use of imaging in COVID-19 based upon the condition of the patient and the degree of local community transmission. I'm not going to review these scenarios here, but I want to point out that every circled number represents a decision point where recommendations are provided. If they are not familiar, then I encourage you to review this open access manuscript at the website for the journal Radiology. A key message of the statement, which is as true today as it was five months ago, is that the critical determinants of the use of imaging relate to key questions such as how sick is the patient? Is there a change in the patient's health status since some prior benchmark? Do the patients have important comorbidities? What is the burden of disease in the community and thus the pretest probability for COVID-19? And is reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction or RT-PCR testing available for assessing COVID-19? Our main recommendations can be distilled into three points. First, imaging is not routinely indicated as a screening test for COVID-19 in asymptomatic individuals, nor is it indicated for patients with mild features of COVID unless they are at risk for disease progression. Secondly, imaging is indicated for patients with moderate to severe features of COVID-19 regardless of COVID-19 test results. And this is principally from the standpoint of stratifying patient risk, guiding triage, and assessing for diagnoses other than COVID-19 to explain the patient's presentation. And finally, third, for patients with COVID-19 and worsening respiratory status, Imaging is indicated to guide advancing the acuity of care and assess for secondary diagnoses to explain clinical worsening. With that overview, I want to focus on results published over the five months since our early April 22 publication, which serve to both emphasize and refine the original recommendations. I will discuss three categories of interim developments. The first is the increasingly limited utility of imaging for establishing the diagnosis of COVID-19 as RT-PCR testing has become more widely available. Secondly, that the degree of severity of imaging findings as assessed by a radiologist or by a computer algorithm stratifies patients and associates both chest x-ray and CT findings with outcomes such as the need for hospitalization, endotracheal intubation, ICU admission, and even death. And finally, systemic thromboembolism has emerged as an important association with COVID-19 and is very important to be aware of. So let's take these in turn. But before we do that, I want to emphasize that with the exception of a single meta-analysis, the data that I'm going to share with you across 13 published studies all rely upon single center inputs and that those single center inputs invariably are going to be heavily influenced by case availability and case selection. By the pretest probability of COVID-19 in the community at the time that the study was performed, by cultural determinants within that community or within that nation as to when in the disease course the patients seek medical care, and the quality and availability of PCR testing. For these reasons, the generalizability of any individual study can be limited, particularly when performed under conditions that differ from your practice environment. So let's begin by discussing COVID-19 diagnosis. And specifically with a meta-regression analysis led by Kim and published in Radiology, diagnostic performance of chest CT and RT-PCR results from 68 individual studies were aggregated by their nine countries of origin. And the results are pretty striking. The x-axis associates the countries by COVID-19 prevalence based upon the positivity rate of COVID-19 testing in local communities. These values range from 1 to 
But please understand that these values are estimates of actual community prevalence and are influenced by local testing availability and use. Nevertheless, the results, as I mentioned, are quite striking. With respect to positive predictive value, which is the likelihood that the patient has COVID-19 given a positive CT or RT-PCR, the solid line corresponds to chest CT across these prevalence estimates and approaches a coin flip for a 38% community prevalence. But as one goes to lower prevalence values, false positive results increasingly dominate over true positive results. The dashed line of RT-PCR, on the other hand, rapidly converges toward 100% positive predictive value. These results underscore the strength of RT-PCR and the limitation of chest CT for establishing a diagnosis of COVID-19 when the test is positive. When the test provides a negative result, they are both quite good at ruling out disease as shown by these blue lines. But the main takeaway here is that diagnosis based upon CT results in substantial overdiagnosis of COVID-19 and that RT-PCR is a far superior test for establishing the presence of the disease. Now, the preceding data on CT interpretation were based on unstructured reporting of CT results. In the interest of refining how we interpret chest CT scans in the setting of COVID-19, and hopefully enhancing interreader agreement, structured approaches to interpretation have been proposed. One such approach is CORADS, which was developed by the Dutch Radiological Society and reported by Matthias Prokop and team. In this scheme, grading from low to very high probability is based upon descriptive pulmonary abnormalities seen with CT. This table is from the original manuscript and provides detailed definitions of the CORADS levels. For example, CORADS-1 corresponds to a normal or non-infectious appearance, while CORADS-3 represents features that are compatible with either COVID-19 or with other diseases. All the way to 5, which is typical for COVID-19, or 6, where it has already been proven diagnosis with RT-PCR. One question in your mind might be, does CT interpretation based upon CORADS improve our ability to diagnose COVID-19? Well, here are data that very nicely show that while CORADS helps to stratify the performance of CT interpretation, there are still tremendous limitations to using CT for the diagnosis. Let's start with symptomatic patients on the left. The green line corresponds to CORADS 1, and as we progress to red for CORADS 5, which represents findings that are most characteristic of COVID-19. In the regions corresponding to prevalence values currently encountered in most communities, namely 5 to 10 percent, that a CT scan with a CORADS rating of 5 only raises the post-test probability up to 35 to 40 percent. In other words, less than half of symptomatic patients with CORADS 5 findings will test positive for COVID-19 when community prevalence is less than 10 percent. And so we have to be very, very careful, even with characteristic CT findings, of making the diagnosis without RT-PCR confirmation. Now, for asymptomatic subjects on the right, CORADS-5 findings uniquely raise post-test probability relative to all other CORADS categories, particularly in communities with widespread transmission, where pre-test probability is over 40%. However, among asymptomatic subjects screened with CT, only 3.5% will have a CORADS-5 scan. So even when structuring our interpretation, these data strongly dispel the notion that we would seek to make a primary diagnosis of COVID-19 with CT. We are going to rely on RT-PCR for diagnosis. A much more promising application for imaging with both radiography and CT is the characterization of COVID-19 severity and its application with health outcomes. Beginning with chest radiography, the severity of findings on emergency department chest radiographs are associated with both hospital admission and subsequent endotracheal intubation. Models that combine clinical indices with chest x-ray findings obtained within 24 hours of admission are associated with subsequent ICU transfer for mechanical ventilation and death from COVID-19. 
Finally, Joseph and colleagues reported the observation that at the time of presentation, non-white patients have more severe radiographic findings than white patients. While the investigators observed an association between radiographic severity and poor outcome independent of race, they specifically demonstrated an association between greater severity of findings on radiographs of non-white patients and worse outcomes for those non-white patients once hospitalized. Artificial intelligence for radiographic detection and grading of COVID-19 has been pursued and offers the potential for effective assessment of COVID-19, particularly in high prevalence regions with limited availability of trained interpreters. Here you see a radiograph with extensive disease, and here is the associated saliency map derived from a convolutional neural network applied to show the association between what the computer is identifying as disease and what we may observe in the radiograph. Here is an example of a patient without COVID-19, and the saliency map shows very minimal findings. When comparing this AI system to the performance of six readers, indicated by these different colored symbols at three operating points, the AI system shown in blue performs at least similar to the readers, and in some cases is superior to the readers in defining the presence of disease. Turning now to CT, data from Columbia and team associating severity of disease as measured by both visual assessment and software-based analysis of CT with patient outcomes. A reduction in lung aeration on unenhanced CT is associated with subsequent ICU admission and death. Interestingly, when the area under the ROC curve for a model based upon the CT finding plus associated clinical indices are compared to clinical indices alone, both perform quite well, with only a small but significant 0.86 versus 0.83 increase when imaging augments clinical assessment. Further supporting the synergy between imaging findings and clinical indices is a study by Homa Yunier and colleagues that offers a couple of interesting insights. The first is that radiomic features, which are extracted using image processing and computerized techniques, were superior to radiologist readings for providing CT interpretation that was associated with ICU admission or death. Echoing the prior study, however, the superior performance of radiomics closely approximated that of clinical indices alone. And the combination of radiomics with clinical indices raises diagnostic performance even higher to 0.85 and 0.84, respectively. These data suggest that there are features that can be automatically extracted from the CT scans that are going to serve as better indicators of disease severity and downstream consequences than radiologist observations alone, and that models that combine CT features with clinical indices offer the best potential to predict COVID-19 outcomes. I mentioned that the degree of lung aeration was automated in the column B study, and I wanted to show you what that analysis looks like. Yellow indicates poorly aerated zones relative to green, which is normal. The fraction of well aerated lung is shown in these pie charts for both cases. In another study from Siemens, varying degrees of lung opacity and severity scores are segmented and quantified on the right using a dense UNET, which is a type of convolutional neural network. Automated segmentation of parenchymal abnormalities on CT will be a critical development if practical and reliable quantitation is to become a part of routine clinical care in tracking severity to manage patients with COVID-19. One final example demonstrates automated segmentation and quantification of COVID-19 severity and distribution with automated assignment of a CORADS rating. This CORADS AI has shown a very nice level of concordance for, with eight independent observers, where weighted kappas of 0.60 for CORADS scores and 0.54 for CT severity scores underscore the agreement. Now, I want to take a moment to emphasize that while the preceding studies associate the severity of imaging findings with health outcomes, we must understand that all of these results are based on retrospective data. Consequently, while they document an association between a future event and an imaging finding, 
they do not establish the predictability of an imaging test for a downstream outcome, which requires a prospectively constructed intervention trial that measures the use of imaging to impact healthcare and subsequently influence outcomes. Only then could we confidently state that imaging and the severity of findings on imaging can be used to manage patients in an evidence-based fashion for predicting downstream outcomes. The final area that I want to touch upon is the growing realization that systemic venous thromboembolism is a fundamental component of COVID-19. The three articles listed here report an incidence of venous thromboembolism that is between 22 and 37 percent for patients receiving contrast-enhanced chest CTs with a diagnosis of COVID-19. This is a very high prevalence indeed. Between one in four and more than one in three subjects found to have pulmonary embolism. These images from Poyati and colleagues demonstrate the coexistence of COVID-19 pneumonia with thrombi in the pulmonary arteries. While I am highlighting venous thromboembolism here, I want to emphasize the thromboembolic phenomena in COVID-19 are not limited to the venous system. They extend into the arterial system and manifest across a variety of vascular beds. I'd like to summarize this micro-learning by emphasizing that evidence published since the publication of the Fleischner guidelines largely supports the recommendations without contradicting them. I can confidently state that the recommendations remain as applicable to our management of patients with COVID-19 today as they were five months ago. Adding to our knowledge is confirmation that imaging has limited utility for establishing COVID-19 diagnosis, particularly as RT-PCR availability has increased. And so we don't use imaging for the establishment of diagnosis. Rather, imaging has the potential to help us understand the severity of the disease when a patient needs to be hospitalized, when a patient needs endotracheal intubation, when a patient needs ICU admission. And the data suggests that we are capable of stratifying imaging findings to make associations and ultimately, hopefully, predictions of these outcomes. Fortunately, we're seeing computer-based techniques emerge to help facilitate our ability to assess severity in a consistent manner, to superior to what we might develop through standard visual assessment. And finally, please remember that systemic thromboembolism is very common in the setting of COVID-19 and an important consideration in managing these patients. Thank you kindly for your interest in the role of chest imaging, for the management of COVID-19 patients, and for watching and listening to this mini-webinar.